small groups. We'll be starting those in the first of the year. We have a few that are already are uh, being noted in our uh, newsletter, but just be watching for that. So Thanksgiving is such an interesting time and emotional health for the holidays is what I thought would be a really good way to kind of start into the season. Uh, for many of us, that's, uh, holidays are not always what we want. It's a practical way to recognize and overcome the rejection that we might have in our life and our spirit. And we're going to speak on that. But before I do, I've always found that like uh, the opportunity to invite family and friends. So I, Corey heard, he's not here today, I don't think, but he came over to our house and uh, typical Corey, me and him have a whole history of things that take place in our lives, but he takes up pumpkin pie and, uh, and I, I'd let him, it looked a little dense on the top when he put the whipped cream on there. He starts eating it. And he's like, this is really sour. And I was like, yep, I think it is. And he just ate a couple more bites, but then he's like, um, it's really, really sour. I think we should tell people. And I said, I think it's sour cream. And, and, and so I waited till he had a few good bites before I told him what I knew to be the facts in the situation. So I bought him in a pumpkin pie and I'll, I'll drop it off at his house. We don't eat it today. So, uh, you know, I don't believe that any of us assume that we're immune to pain. Actually, we all have experienced it, and at one time or another, maybe even right now, through these holidays, you, it's more acute, and it's more known. When I speak to pain, I'm speaking to the effect of our whole person and how we can experience pain. One of the things that I, we're going to jump into the text is Genesis 29, if you want to turn there, and I'm going to speak to, uh, from Leah's lens, on rejection. But before we do, I wanted to kind of dive into kind of a little bit more of a psychological understanding of who we are. And uh, I know that we're mind, will, and emotion in our soul, that we're physical, we're thinking and mental uh, construct, and that we have spirit, so soul, spirit, and physical body. But in the emotion and relation in our spiritual and our physical body, we have this physical person. In that, we have this thinking man, our mental capacity. In that, we have our spiritual influence in which... God directs, and in our relation, which is kind of what the holidays bring out the best of us. God designs of our person are connected in every way. And that's why at the center of our person is pain, oftentimes, or joy. But this is deliberate that the soul of our person, the whole of our pain, is built into these things. How many know that when, whenever you feel like physically ill, that you emotionally are a little down? or when you're relationally at odds, that it kind of affects your emotion, or even maybe your spiritual walk, if you know you're in sin, that you don't walk towards the light, but you walk away from the light. So God's design in us is a physical and emotional, relational and spiritual being. In other words, we have a soul, and that soul can experience the whole of pain in any of these four areas, which in part or in whole can affect the other portions in part or in whole. So it's important to realize that sometimes when we're just down and out, that this is a great way to determine where that pain is coming from. A couple questions that you can ask yourself when you're feeling down is why? See, God uses pain as a megaphone to speak into our lives. And there's a reason why he does that. You, we can make pain like pointless, like there's no reason for it in our life where we just are stubborn and we don't learn from it. But on the other side, we can actually purpose our pain. We can actually learn in the lessons of what this pain represents. And I believe God uses pain in our life as it says that he chastens those in whom he loves. He actually uses pain as an educator for us. It teaches us. You know, Hebrews actually says that Jesus learned from the lessons of his suffering. So do you think Jesus experienced physical pain in his life? We don't need to show hands believe he did. Relational pain? There's nobody that was more rejected. How about in his mental capacity? This is an area that in his thinking in Gethsemane, God, if you can take this cup from me, please do. Is there any other way? So the capacity of his thinking was, was challenged as he pursued it. And in his spiritual relation, he only did what the father taught him, told him to do. But every single one of these areas kind of blend together to make us where we're at. And so sometimes I think we need to listen when things aren't right, when we're not feeling good. 
when things are at odds, when relations are broken, when our thinking is a little skewed and we're justifying, denying, or working away, or maybe our spirit. But here's what we want to do. We want to submit to God. Our physical body feels pain and can cause illness. Perhaps uh, even the treatments of our body can create like physical disciplines like exercise, but on the other side, those treatments can actually make us feel more ill. Uh, they call them a the colon cleanse. And then the dreaded age factor, as we get older, right? As we get older, our body experiences more pain as things begin to fail. And as we get older, life experiences shares more pain with us. How about the psychological or emotional side? Experience anxiety or depression, maybe fear or even anger. Brokenness can come in all shapes and sizes in our emotion. Spiritually, we can be angry with God. We can have a loss of faith or question or fear that has forsaken our need, that maybe he has forsaken us. And these are things that we need to actually be aware of and not deny. Perhaps our identity is in crisis or we still are seeking to find our purpose. And one of the largest culprits is the fear of the unknown. In our spiritual walk, the unknown, oftentimes, and even when we experience uh, physical pain in our life, I've heard many that say, I can handle the pain. I just want to know how long. How long, oh Lord? How long will this cancer be in my system? How long, Lord, will I be feeling this emotion? How long will this feel this way? Now, the most important thing to take away is the in-between of all these feelings. It's a surrender. It's a choice. Where do you place your focus? Because in the center of the, his will is the center of your being, where he belongs. And we can listen to our physical, our emotional, our spiritual, and our relational part of our being and surrender it to God. That's the most important thing we can take away. First rule with the total of our pain, that God uses this for our good and for his purpose. Some of us deny the pain in our life because we don't believe it has any good quality to it but yet it's what shapes us. I just heard the gentleman saying that, you know, an ax, when it hits wood, it dulls it. But when it hits iron, it sharpens it. So sometimes I think we're just swinging away at things that are a little bit like wood in our life. Some relationships are just a little bit woody, not so iron sharpening iron. And we need to be aware of that. So I wanted to say to the church, the best place to talk about mental and emotional health is right here. Now, I strongly encourage you, if you don't know or think so, to take the opportunity and share what you're experiencing, not just in this season, but in your life, so that God can rise to the surface through these four elements of our life, like where we truly are with him and with each other, because God can help us draw to a more authentic life. And that's why one of the things I wanted to speak on today, God is able to work in those moments and help us guide us through better tomorrows and todays. But the example that I wanted to bring is uh, rejection. I thought Genesis would be a great uh, lens to look from in rejection in our spirit. How many remember playing a game, uh, Heads Up, Seven Up? As a kid, seven, seven guys were uh, chosen. They all stand in the front. We got our heads down. We'd always end our day in school with our heads down, our thumbs up. And I, I remember multiple times over that uh, many sessions would take place and and you're just like, am I just putting my head down for an hour because there are 20 minutes, whatever, felt like an eternity because nobody picks you. You ever been on the other side of the team where you're just not picked? Dodgeball, that was my, my favorite. I, I wasn't picked because I had weak arms. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps family holidays or gatherings, figuring out who goes where and who's left or left out, especially in the process of divorce. When you're like, where do the kids go? Right? Which, which one gets them first? It's the spirit of rejection, even in the term of who gets them first. But this is how Leah might have felt. Not in the crowd, not in the in crowd, as you would say. Maybe not picked last, right? So that's kind of how Leah is in the Bible. She felt, and I can imagine how Leah must have uh, felt unwanted, literally... Uh, told to her face that she was not wanted. I didn't want you. I didn't ask for you. You were not my first choice, but I'm stuck with you. I have to deal with you. How horrible that message is. 
felt how forgotten or unloved a message can be right in the center of the pain, the total pain. How many messages are you hearing in your life denying the processing power that God has given you to surrender to him? Maybe it's from your childhood that you felt rejected. Maybe it's from your family. And it's just kind of interesting how through the holidays, it kind of just drives right up to the top of the, like oil and water. And uh, I know that in my own, I actually had to just kind of stop myself because there's times in my own holiday spirit, I get a little brittle, like peanut brittle. It's just weird, but it happens. We just kind of get to a place and you're like, what is triggering this? And I'm sheltering, I'm guarding, I'm guiding myself through this process because I don't want to be hurt, right? Again, again, when was I hurt first? We start asking these questions. We start asking God. Now, this is where Leah was, so we're going to read Genesis 29. And this is kind of just where my devotion's been uh, through the process here. Uh, we want this to be for our character and our growth. When we submit to God, God can use all things for the good of those that love him. Don't let pain be purposeless in your life. That's the first message. And when I was just uh, kind of deciding in reaching into this holiday season, I grabbed a Bible I don't typically grab, and I started from the beginning, and that's, this is where I landed this week. But my hope is to actually read through the Word of God uh, before the end of the year. And anybody wants to join me, you're welcome to. I'm ahead of you, so we'll compete. <laughs> but I believe God just kind of just brings things to its fruition when we just purpose in our hearts. And I value the word of God. And I'm like, I want to end this year with the word of God in me, right? So here's where we'll take notice, chapter 29 of Genesis. And uh, before we get started here, Jacob works for his soon-to-be father-in-law for seven years. Little uh, tidbit there. Uh, because the eldest daughter, Leah, had not been married, uh, and that was her custom, he kind of snuck her into the, the wedding bed that night of, I would assume because there's candlelit tents, might have been a little easier, maybe there's a little bit of wine drunk, I don't know, but you'd have to be very drunk. So I think it was just really, really dark. <laughs> it was really, really dark. And uh, so Jacob there is awakened, and immediately he says, well, that's not what I bargained for here. But in that, it doesn't say that he worked another seven years waiting for Rachel. He actually received Rachel in the same week. Uh, so let's finish the ceremony. Uh, and so I'll give you Rachel as well if you worked for me for seven more years. This is where the hostility begins between these two. So we have a relationship. This wife, polygamy is not really something that we uh, think is good today. Uh, it's not wise to have two wives. But we'll start here. Verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he had opened her womb. But Rachel was unable to conceive. Leah conceived, gave birth to a son, named him Reuben. For she said, the Lord has seen my affliction. Surely my husband will love me now. One thing that's really important is the name Reuben does not mean, surely the Lord has seen my affliction. And oftentimes when you see the customary response to a name, you see its meaning uh, in the word of God that kind of is represented. Reuben just means uh, son of man. Like here is a man that is born. Behold, a son. And she uh, responds with a little bit different perception of the Lord has seen my affliction. Surely my husband will love me now. 33, she conceived again, gave birth to a son and said, the Lord heard that I'm unloved has given me this son also. So she named him Simeon. She conceived again, gave birth to a son and said, at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne three sons for him. Therefore, he was named Levi. And she conceived again, gave birth to a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah. Then Leah stopped having children just for a season. So Leah, she married, not satisfi satisfied, she still feels like there's something missing, right? She's given into marriage and by their tradition and custom really wasn't by her choice. But to walk into a marriage that you're unloved and unwanted, it's not a great start. She's literally told that she's not loved to her face. She knew that she wasn't Jacob's first choice and she knew that she didn't get picked. 
knowing this made her feel unloved. And that's where verse 32 says how she responds. Lord, has seen my affliction. Surely my husband, he will love me now. So Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. She said that the Lord has noticed my misery. Leah decided maybe when I start having kids, he'll love me more. Maybe if I'm the first wife to have kids, he might even love me more than my sister, Rachel. That sounds a lot like people pleasing to me. She thought that if she could please her husband with a child, she would feel loved and she would feel validated. This is not how it works. And this leads me to my first point, that people are not and can never be your standard of validation. People can compliment you, but they can't validate you. Only God can do that. That's his job. You know, it's interesting too, because Leah, she, she makes effort to produce result in her own strength. There's nothing wrong with childbearing, but her purpose of childbearing was incorrect. Maybe he will love me if I do this, this people-pleasing mindset. Maybe you feel that way sometimes, that you have walked into a relationship and through that process that you have given for the wrong motive and reason, hoping that somebody will in return love you, like you, compliment, and validate you for who you are. So that people are not and can never be your standard for validation. People can compliment and see good, but they cannot validate. That is the right of God. And within the purpose that you were created for, see, this is the hand of God. Our focus is not outward on the response of how others see us, but rather upward on how and who, for who he says that we are. And I think sometimes we do lose our focus, especially in these seasons. It's easier to lose that. I passed the slide and I'll back it up really quick, but correction, not rejection. See, the words that the Lord is speaking to us right now, and I believe that actually the feelings that Leah was feeling were to help correct her but she turned them to rejection. See, if God wants to change the measure of our heart, he works through painful moments and events. And I believe that in the process of how we can allow that pain to have purpose, we can say, God, why do I feel this way? And I believe God will answer. I think his spirit is so clear sometimes, all the time. But when we're listening, when we're listening, all the time, he will speak. He'll make it clear of why we're feeling this rejection. I have to tell this to my daughter all the time. I am correcting you, not rejecting you. That emotion comes up, right? We can, we can make this false assumption that the emotions, the melancholy feeling that I have right now is because I'm being rejected. When really it's God just saying, hey, I'm just gonna turn this a little bit so that you have a better focus. And you're gonna have a consequence. Why is the consequence? Because you did something that needs to be corrected. And that's how the Lord works. Oh, back here. Within the purpose that you were created for, it is the hand of God. I pray that our focus is not outward and that response of how others see us, but rather upward. Can someone agree today, waiting for the validation from your family or your friends or working tirelessly, tirelessly in the process to make people see you is a try harder model. And we get very fond of that. And we can waste so much time and attention on how others make us feel. But in the end, our energy is wasted. Our emotions are no better off because our validation is in the identity in who Christ says that we are. So when you put yourself out there based upon what you've done, You've left yourself open for criticism rather than the correction of God, the criticism of others. Genesis 1.27 says that God created man in his own image, a being that, the greatest being actually in all the universe, the greatest of anything that ever existed, created me and he created you in his own image. And he said, you know, what I love is this person, you. So much that I want to take them to look like me I want them to think like me, and I want them to talk like me. If that's not validation in itself, I don't know what it is. God actually created us in his image. He breathed into us life. We are to model our life after his image. That's validation. Romans 5.8 is so clear. While we were still in our sin, Christ died for us. He gave you value and worth. 
It's not something that can be overlooked. It's something that we need to be mindful of. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. There again, worthy is the lamb who was slain for you and I, determining the worth of your very life. Not only are we validated by God alone, but God sees you, God hears you, he feels you, he sees your true value, and in the same time, he also knows what it feels like to feel rejected. We may relate with this because when first we don't succeed, we try again, right? That's what we always do. When first we don't succeed, try, try harder. Verse 33, she conceived again. She gave birth to a son and said, the Lord heard that I'm unloved and has given me this son. So she named him Simeon. Simeon, for she's, the Lord heard that I was unloved and has given me another son. It continues in the verse 34 to say she has another child, names him Levi. Surely this time, surely this time, she says, finally my husband will feel affection for me since I have given him three sons. I've done all this work. Maybe my parents will finally see that I'm a good kid. Maybe groups of people over there will finally invite me to their little gatherings. If there's anyone in all of humanity that understands the true feeling of rejection, it is Christ. Jesus faced the worst rejection of all time. From the start of this time on earth until now, some of us still reject him, even though he endured it all and has experienced it all while he was perfectly sinless. That right there is even more proof that no matter what you do or don't do, it won't make you any more accepted by him. There's always gonna be people out there that make us feel that we're not enough or that we're not accepted. See, that's not your problem. That's their problem. And that's kind of what we focus on with Jacob here. It's actually Jacob's problem. Because if you look in contrast, he rejects Leah because of her unlovely look or weak eyes. Or, but he also rejects Rachel later in the story. I'll show you. When Rachel saw, chapter 30, that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she invited her sister, give me sons or I will die, she said to Jacob. Jacob became angry with Rachel and said, am I in God's place? Who has withheld offspring from you? So here's Rachel. She's got it all going all on the outside, but no product on the inside, no production on the inside. We, we know people like that. They look good on the outside. You think, man, they got it all together, but on the inside, they're dying. On the other side, you got Leah, which continues to produce, but produce for the wrong reason, produces for the wrong intent. See, she has the opportunity to birth something in her for good, We'll get to that. But here's where I see the crux of the issue. It's the other side of the relationship. It's Jacob that has the problem. Jacob is the one that compares. Jacob is the one that holds things at bay and makes them both feel worthless. And then this is where we see this, this constant pain in their relationships. And then there's conflict and manipulation, rejection and comparison, and they keep working against each other the whole time. Sometimes those relationships, those toxic relationships, are, it's good that they end. <laughs> it's good that they don't uh, last longer than they should, where we can recognize that they don't, they don't birth things of value. Some people just need to change, and we need boundaries. John 1.11 says, He came to his own, and those who were with him own did not receive him. Sometimes it's even those around you. That even though Jesus felt this rejection, he knew his foundation. He knew what his true value was and where his true worth was. I'm pretty sure it hurt. Probably, but that's exactly why he is our anchor and man is not. He understands the most what we feel when we feel rejection in any circumstance. Anything that you've ever gone through, know that Jesus knows it and he feels it, regardless if it could be the worst gut-wrenching feeling on earth. Jesus understands Leah. She missed the memo, but what God was trying to really show her was that maybe you're not whatever you're trying to create to solve the problem. I hear you. I got you and I'm with you. 
He blessed her. He opened her womb. And he said, I'm going to give you children. But that was to show her that he's thinking of her. I remember you. I see you and hear you. He's got you. He's with you too. It wasn't until baby number four that Judah, that Leah, she gets it. And we can get it too. The point here is to overcome rejection with a focus on praise. On the one that matters. It's just practical. Our praise will eliminate the noise of rejection in our life. That's the, that's the intent. We need to allow for our praise to focus. And I, you know, it's interesting because you can think that Leah spent her lifetime uh, being rejected and feeling that way. And I wish she would have known the end of the story. Because if you read in Matthew and the genealogy, there's a very clear picture there. Judah is the one that was birthed with right purpose and reason. And what comes from that is Christ Jesus. Leah was a part of the lineage that brought Christ into the world. Leah is the one that brought the savior of the world through the circumstance where she finally got the correction that God was saying in the direction that he had for her, that he had purpose. And she said, for this one, I praise him. For this one, I'm going to praise. You know, we go through a lot of conflicts and we go through a lot of rejection in our life and we can use it for the good. I think she had lost sight of the one who was with her all along and who truly validated her in, in the entirety of time. I'm kind of excited though that her language switched up and she decided instead to focus on God and his goodness and praise him. Our praise will eliminate the noise of rejection in our life. But one thing that I think is really of value is it can amplify the truth of God's word in our life as well. So let us eliminate the noise of rejection. Amplify the truth of God's acceptance when you feel rejected. Verse 35, once again, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to another son. She named him Judah, for she said, now I will praise the Lord. And then she stopped having children. Leah named her last son Judah, which literally means praise or thanksgiving. God had validated her way before she even realized way before she even realized. Literally, God was there the entire time. It hit her that weight. God was there the entire time and saw me because praise changes things. The importance of worship, the importance of praise is praise. It's not just singing songs and giving your whole heart during worship. Is It's making a playlist when you're at home maybe and listening to worship. Maybe every day or every other day just to kind of check that the no praise in your lifestyle might be reflecting upon a reason that you need to take and consider. So these are just some practical things. I know that like listening to worship and songs can help us with our focus. That's why we do it when we enter into this place is so that we can turn our hearts towards God so that we can open up our hearts and just say, God, I may have gone through a few circumstances this week, but Yet, I will praise you. How in the world can I praise God feeling like this? Or after all that I've been through, after all that I've dealt with, how can I have the strength to praise God? Have you ever felt that way? He is good. That's really the only reason you can give, because he is good. We don't praise him when we feel like it. We praise past the feelings. We praise past the noise. And when we recognize the help that we need, when we seek it by talking to someone, and when we praise God through it all, that is when the true healing starts. See, God takes your praise and he'll turn it into breakthrough. He doesn't just say he thanks you for praising him or good talk, you know, and go about his way. He sees where your heart needs mending in the process. And still, he wants to mend it. Jesus still saves. Jesus still heals. Jesus still validates. Just because you were raised in a different type of household just because maybe you never knew one of your parents, maybe you're going through divorce. Maybe you're going through that, the hardship of determining where the children go. Maybe you're in your own right feeling mental illness or fatigue or physical illness. And perhaps, I know I am, perhaps holidays come up 
on you and you only remember what you don't have rather than what you do have. Mm. Kind of like Leah here, who over and over missed what God was doing. The effects of rejection, of feeling rejection, can be long-lasting into our adulthood, by the way. If we don't deal with it, you may or may not realize it, but somehow, some way, you might have already felt that it can cause mental and emotional breakdown and distress. You can have trouble trusting yourself and trusting others and ultimately trusting God. You can have trouble accepting love, including God's love. It turns into physical pain and can even affect our brain and its function. This goes back to our whole being. They're not separated. Our makeup is all-inclusive and one part of us is not whole or healed. When one part is rejected or thought to be direct rejected, it is left out of our person. It's really interesting, but we talk about rejection like we're waiting and feeling other people's rejection, but there's a part of us that when we are rejected long enough in relation or by words that are spoken over us, that we reject that part of ourselves. And that part of us actually is almost not trusted. And so we kind of put it aside in a sense. And so I'm not exactly sure if I'm really good at relationships because I've always failed at them. I'm not really sure if I'm really wanted in these relationships because I haven't been given the opportunity to see success. Some of those things can start all the way from your childhood. And when mom and dad are broken and they're dealing with their own issues, they just allow that your brokenness kind of carries right into your own thinking as if you're the cause or the fault. And then we just reject that part of our life. I can't compartmentalize my childhood and put it off to the side and just, now I'm an adult, I'm independent of my past and my emotion or my pain. It doesn't work that way. All the pain you've ever experienced is still residing within you, either as a teacher or without purpose. God can bring those things to the forefront and the spirit can actually work for the good of those that love him. And we can work on those things to correct our relationships, work on those things to correct our thinking, work on those things to correct our spiritual walk with the Lord. And in the end, empower us by his work in his name, his truth, to see what's ahead in a whole new light. I think it is worthy of saying that Leah felt rejected. She kind of had it all wrong, trying to produce something with her own ability to be loved and liked. She flipped the script. God spoke to her life and she says, you know what? This, I'm going to say, is because of God's validation in my life and not going to try to work out the rejection that Jacob was giving to her. Now, it, would, it wouldn't be sufficient if we stopped there and only focused on Leah as the victim of her thinking because there are two other people in the story. And by comparison, Rachel is cruel. And Jacob, by his comparison, is cruel. And maybe the rejection isn't what you felt but what you've served out to others. Maybe you've rejected people by comparison. Maybe you rejected them because you yourself feel compared. It's interesting that Rachel recognizes that she can't produce and she says, I'm going to die because she can't. She's competing with her sister from the very beginning of this relationship. Sometimes in our own siblings, in our own life, in our families, sometimes the, that old, we call it junior high, right? Like in junior high when we like somebody really like somebody and then we don't like them and then because we don't like them we tell everybody else not to like them <laughs> but we still do that sometimes we still work and push people away so a couple alternatives that we can take away from this is that we can purpose the pain in our life recognize that the only person that can ever validate who you are and your identity is christ and if you're struggling because of your upbringing, if you're struggling when you're in the holiday season because it brings closer relation, when you're struggling because you're not exactly sure who you are and what your identity is, surrender to Christ and recognize that he has validated you. He has brought you up with a purpose. On the other side, maybe you are the perpetrator and not the victim. Maybe you have been the one that 
for your own insecurities and your own melancholy have been the one that rejects others to feel good about yourself. I would surrender that to God too. Maybe it is because you lack the ability to produce the same results that others have in their life. And you wonder why, God, why have you forsaken me? But he hasn't. You're just different. It's okay to recognize the differences that God has put in each and every one of us. We're not all alike. We're not all the same. But each one doing his part. We're all one body. But I think it is important that we allow the Spirit of God to kind of work in us, through us, and allow us to see that the spirit of rejection, just the effort of rejection in our life can really damage us, especially when not addressed. But it also can aid us. Jesus was rejected and it helped propel him towards the cross. So if you feel rejected for who you are, that's a lie. If you feel rejected for what you do, you might need to correct some of your steps. But I will promise you that if you turn and surrender to Christ, mm -hmm. that you will find that your identity and value is secure in him and only in him. I pray right now, actually, we'll stand and kind of end this. It's less of a message, more of a devotion, just kind of bringing out some of the things that I think God desires in all of us to recognize that he is there for you right now to correct your thinking, to correct the relationships of your life, to correct what you physically are feeling, and truly to walk out the spiritual call that he has on your life. Our identity is found in solely in Christ Jesus. First, that's our foundation. Not in how others feel about you, not what others think about you. And some of us have felt rejection in this season. Some of you have felt it at such a level that you have to ask God, when will it end? Some of us have rejected those that are in our life in a way as if we have a choice. Instead of obediently asking God, what is the purpose of these people in my life? And how can I be you? in their life? How can I show them light and love? Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you heal still today. You correct in every way. I pray, God, that you would work in and through our lives and beyond the words that I can think through. And I know that your spirit is still at work. Humbly, Lord, we just... We want to accept you today. You are the deliverer. You are the whole part of who I need to be. May I not reject you or reject any part of me that you've made. I pray, God, that you would, by your spirit, begin to mend and heal in the wounds that we have, both in memory from our past or even in our current day. And just for like Leah, who through the genealogy brought the savior of the world, I pray that we would extinguish the idea of the brokenness of the families that we were created into and recognize the one that you have grafted us into, adopted, and that you've given us a new name and have been validated. So Spirit of God, work in and through us work on your good and your good pleasure for your will. And if there is anything in me, Lord, that needs change or anything inside that needs correction or any emotion that just needs to be embraced, let us not deny who we are. But work through it for the good of those that love you. Just let you work. Be you. In your holy and precious name. Amen.